Hey there. Can't hear you. How about now? Okay. Not quite loud enough, but louder than nothing. <laughs> I'll try to speak louder. Hey? So I'll try to speak louder. Okay. I was just bringing in some cat food. I had gone to the store at my usual time on Wednesday, and I couldn't get any cat food. So a neighbor offered me a lift to uh, to town and then bought me lunch. Nice. Yeah. What's happening? Uh, you know, actually, I was remembering, I was talking to my dad last night, and I was remembering this, like, weird uh, occurrence when I was probably, like, eight years old. Um, he, br- he brought me to a cemetery, my sister and I, because we wanted to go to one because we've never been to one. So he brought us to one uh, by my house. And, um, you know, and we're walking around there and then we're actually kind of like jumping around on just, you know, being children playing around. And he said, you know, don't, you know, be be a little bit more respectful because there's, you know, people's loved ones here, you know, so you don't want to be just jumping around on people's graves and people here, they'll be upset. So that was like a little lesson. Right. And then, um, so we get in the car and we start driving and on the right side of uh, the road, you know, it was like, uh, the street was lined with woods. And then um, out of, like, the corner of my eye, I see this this dog, full-grown dog, coming out of the woods, chasing a yellow napkin that was floating in the air. And, huh. then we, hit the, and we hit the dog and killed it. Huh. <laughs> and I'm like, what kind of dog ever chases a, a, a napkin? Or a, even that the, a napkin would be in the air long enough for a dog to start chasing you coming out of a, the woods, you know? Like, <laughs> huh. Strange. Kind of, kind of weird, right? <laughs> yeah. Of course, a dog is the word God backwards. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so maybe that was a uh, hint of things to come as creation takes back control over the uh, universes of the universes. <laughs> How old were you? I want to say eight, nine. Yeah. Hmm. That's our address here, right? <laughs> nine oh eight. <laughs> yeah. So, where were we? Um. I guess Jenny was still there the two months or so. 66 days or something? Yeah, something like that. When we talked the last time? I believe so. Yeah. Well, Jennifer uh, was taken uh, to a court in Brogsville from the Ottawa Carlton Detention Center for the, I guess it was the third, third or fourth journey to Brockville. And uh, the lawyer or the Crown attorney who had suggested that Jennifer be incarcerated at the Royal Ottawa Psychiatric Hospital so that they could figure out whether or not she was competent to stand trial. You know, what the test is for competency to stand trial is somebody says, uh, what's that person sitting on the bench? And if you say the word judge, you're competent to stand trial. So what they had in mind uh, 
had been discredited by um, a diagnosis which they apparently handed to the judge saying this is from the head psychiatrist in Brogville and the thing was so badly written that it didn't make sense uh, for a, supposedly a guy with six degrees and order of Canada medal and all that. And the judge had said uh, that Jennifer could speak and Jennifer gave a talk to the court and the judge on everything that had occurred uh, since she was arrested without a warrant and without any judge ever signing a deportation order that she knows about, uh, and nobody's been able to produce one, so she doesn't quite grasp why they're doing what they're doing. And the judge said, uh, uh, well, they've dropped all the charges. Uh, and uh, I'm basically out of this. So I can't do anything. And she kept looking at that written thing that was so badly written, didn't make sense. She didn't understand what they were doing either. So anyways, they said that there was going to be on Friday at the end of October um, a hearing held by a judge from uh, immigration. And that judge would make uh, a determination on whether or not Jennifer could be uh, described as landed immigrant in Canada unless these lawyers could come up with another reason uh, for for uh, deporting her. And that was put off for a week and a half or something. And on the Friday, she was taken to a basement in the detention center where there was a video hearing from Montreal. And the, the guy in Montreal, the judge was saying to the lawyers, you know, Mrs. Keeley has very strong links to Canada. She's married to a Canadian. She lives with him on the farm. They've been married for five years. I don't understand why you're doing this. And um, he said, I'm going to withhold my judgment until next Friday. And f the next Friday uh, would be the last Friday in October. Now, this is being done in the context that Canada has a new government and they are being sworn in on November 4th. So it's basically in the last days of the former government of Canada, run by uh, Stephen Harper and being the uh, Conservative Party being replaced by the Liberals on uh, November 4th. So as they came out of the uh, the meeting with that judge from Montreal on video, the guy who was kind of in charge of holding her and dragging her all over the place um, had a badge on him that said enforcement officer. That's the first time she saw the badge. And he is Iranian. And 
Uh, he said to Jennifer, you'll be going out of the country on uh, November 2nd, which is basically the Monday coming, when in fact the judge has said he'd give his decision the next Friday and wouldn't answer questions. If he's going to declare me a landed immigrant status, what are you going about telling me I'm going to be out of the country on Monday? So she was kind of uh, in a quandary talking to me. Uh, I don't know which one has what power. An enforcement officer from the border guards who's an Iranian or a judge from Montreal on video, and I don't even know if that's a real judge or not. So she uh, was awakened at 1.45 in the morning on November the 2nd. And standing beside the bed was this Iranian enforcement officer who is a Sufi uh, and a, a woman who's a, an officer uh, as well, and they uh, dragged her out of bed took her to a side room. Uh, she was made to strip so she could be searched. She was told uh, to get dressed, told she couldn't take any of her papers regarding her court hearing. Uh, and they took her out two o'clock in the morning to a van uh, driven by uh, a guy with a nine millimeter Glock pistol in his belt. Uh, and they drove uh, to the Ontario Quebec border at the town called Regal. Regal, of course, uh, phonetically in French transfers to gore in English, which is a three-sided uh, piece of land or a uh, piece of something, a triangle. And Al Gore is one of the principles of that movement. And Gorbachev, Gorby Gore, is also a participant and the water at the base of the falls, uh, or not the falls, the locks that lead from Lake Huron up into Lake Superior, where the Lou at the Sioux will occur, uh, the water right at the base is called Gore Bay. They stop the van at Regal and went into Tim Hortons. Now, Rigo is the headquarters of CBSA Training Center in a Benedictine monastery. And they came back with an envelope. Um, I thought it might have been airline tickets. She said, no, but they already had those. What it was was an envelope with money that she was to be given on her arrival, wherever that would be. They drove to the airport in Montreal. The guy that had enforcement officer, the Persian guy, the Iranian guy, was nervous as hell, shaking as he was talking to the security guards at the airport. And they kept repeating to him, we've never seen anything like this. Where are the regular papers? We don't know what this is all about. 
and eventually they let them board the plane, and the guy with the gun stayed behind while the woman and the Persian sat on either side of Jennifer in the back seat. She discovered uh, after a while uh, that they were on their way to California. And about a half an hour before landing at LAX, or whatever they call it, airport in uh, Los Angeles, they took her handcuffs, which were made out of leather. Uh, they claim it hurts less than metal, but it's probably because it's not as noticeable as metal. And then they started an argument at the back of the plane, making it look as if Jennifer was the center of the argument. The two of them were yelling at her and, and whatever from both sides, and Jennifer just sat there and didn't say a word. Not known to her at the time, they had told the pilot that they had this dangerous, crazy woman with them, uh, that they were getting off at the airport, and would he call the police and let them know what was happening? Jennifer couldn't figure out what they were doing this for because she didn't even know where they were going. When they got off the plane and came down the corridor from the airplane, she saw five police coming in their direction, one of them a woman. And uh, they stopped them and uh, uh, whatever was being said was about a crazy woman they were bringing. And a woman, police woman, stepped up towards Jennifer, but Jennifer said she was being very careful not to come within striking distance of me. She looked as if she was afraid that I might lash out or something. And Jennifer just stood there. And the woman said something, of course, that Jennifer, with her former job as as the director of nursing of a 99-bed locked-down uh, long-term care institution uh, has heard many times when somebody is brought in to their place, they try to find out if they're crazy or not. So the first question was, do you know what country you're in? Of course, Jennifer said, the United States of America. Do you know who the president is? Yeah, Obama. Do you know what date it is? Yeah, November 2nd. you know what year it is? Yeah, 2015. So the police looked at the two people who were supposed to be guarding a crazy woman as if they were crazy. And at that stage of the game, uh, they took off. And the police took down Jennifer's uh, uh, name uh, on the passport, asked if she was going to any place in particular. Uh, she opened the envelope that... Uh, contained supposedly the, the money that was to allow her uh, to exist for a while, and it contained $50. Now, if you know Los Angeles and the airport, you can't even get a taxi for 50 bucks. So I got a hold of her, and I don't want to go into the details of the cell and all that at this time, but to make a long story short, uh, 
she was taken to Las Vegas. And the idea behind what we were doing was that she would fly back to Ottawa and go back to the detention center and say, you know, I have uh, an appointment on Friday with the guy from Montreal on video and I was kidnapped and I got away and now I'm back. Uh, but they realized they didn't have enough money. So she was taken back to uh, Los Angeles where uh, after uh, a, a day or two, and by this time she's developing, uh, uh, what is it, bronchitis, could hardly speak. You know, she had been in jail, run back and forth for 74 days in all. And um, conditions in the jail, um, too cold, too hot, can't get properly dressed, can't get, you know, you know what they do in jail. A uh, bunch of people who uh, are pissed off at the world running the place. In any event, she had become fairly weak and and began to cough, so they, they were trying to get some medicines to get her going. And eventually, she um, was uh, contacted by her daughter. She hadn't spoken to her daughter in five years, uh, the daughter having been uh, perturbed, I guess is the word, uh, Jennifer having to leave California in a hurry back in 2010, and she hadn't answered her phone calls, that kind of stuff. Plus, being a young person uh, in her mid-twenties or something, she uh, she doesn't speak on the telephone most of the time. She wants to, uh, whatever you guys call it, tweet or keyboard or whatever. In any event, uh, her daughter came to meet her and brought her a bag full of uh, clothes that she had just bought uh, enough uh, clothes to give her a few changes from the clothes she had from prison, I guess, or the gardening clothes she had when she was picked up illegally without any any warrant by the Ontario Provincial Police. Uh, she was then brought to a warehouse, and uh, there were a number of Japanese people. Now, if you remember correctly, uh, I have sent the manuscript for my book to Latvia and Japan uh, a few years ago, and uh, the uh, the people in uh, Japan hadn't responded quickly enough, and I told them that I was withdrawing their right to do the book, and they were saying, well, we would rather do this book, uh, hold on to it until such time as the Lou at the Sioux occurs, and then it would re really be a bestseller. The title of the book being Who Killed America? The um, uh, people were uh, setting up a stage to do a film, and Jennifer couldn't understand what they were saying because they're all speaking in Japanese, but it's possible that they were doing a scene from the book. Um, 
in any event, Jennifer uh, was given a telephone and her daughter gave her a tablet and and between the two of them apparently she can look up things on the net and and on her phone and depends on something you guys call Wi-Fi. I'm too old for that stuff. I don't know exactly what it is that I'm talking about here. But she she began to do research on the people that had dealt with her after she was uh, arrested. And obviously what we're dealing with is is a uh, Canadian border security agency not not a government department but an agency which obviously says they work for a third party their contract just like IRS is contracted to the United States to do revenue collections, uh, and in Canada is called uh, CCRA, Canada Customs and Revenue Agency. These people don't really work for the country. They have another uh, assignment uh, which explains, at least to me, who's been in the investigation business for 30 years, that uh, that would explain how drugs get into all Western countries in in quantities sufficient to distribute all over. And that could never happen if there was a border guard guarding the border. It suggests that the border guards are, in fact, the smugglers. And they'll arrest freelancers every now and then to make it appear as if they're in that business of working for the country. But just Jennifer's qualifications to become a Canadian, which I believe would rank as number one, and made her ineligible to these border people. Uh, and what they want to bring into the country, rather than people who will work for the improvement of a lot of Canadians, such as the ability to run a 99-bed lockdown long-term care center, which the government of Canada says is the most needed uh, employment or job that is open to the right people in Canada, they wouldn't let her in, and they refused to call me her husband uh, so that if they had any questions, I could explain it to them and they locked her out of the country for two and a half years in Ogdensburg and then began by allowing her to visit on weekends. But then the people in Ogdensburg, led by the Grey Nuns, began to apply pressure on their landlord, who had just told Jennifer a couple of weeks before she was the best tenant they ever had, that they wanted her out of the the building and that uh, the wife was getting instructions. She was a Catholic school teacher, was getting instructions from nuns in California and all of this stuff. And in any event, Jennifer had to come in as a refugee uh, on a day, the coldest day in January in 2013, I think it was, um, and was not advised by anybody at the border 
or anybody on the Canadian side that you cannot be a refugee from the United States and Canada, and you cannot be a refugee into the United States from Canada because there is a treaty signed between the two parties that say nobody could claim that anybody wants to do them any harm in any of these countries, and they name Australia, New Zealand, England, France, Germany, U.S. In any event, Jennifer, uh, if she had been a refugee, uh, had to go through a process which they demanded she go through, uh, health check and that kind of stuff, and then it's all supposed to arrive at a decision within 15 days, Yet she was allowed to stay in Canada for uh, the last refugee uh, uh, meeting we had was about four and a half years after her original rejection. And uh, it was only done by a clerk uh, saying that she was being rejected as a as a person in Canada by the Refugee Board without adding that you can't get a yes. It's not legal to allow a refugee from the U.S. Even though their offices are right next door to McGill University who have been accused and found guilty of running a CIA MK Ultra program right there at the University of McGill in the, uh, 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 what do they call it, Montreal Neurological Institute, run by an American doctor called Wilder Penfield, uh, who in fact was disallowed the right to run the experiments he wanted to do on brains and memory in the U.S., but was funded by the Rockefeller family to uh, open the Montreal Neurological Institute and do the work for the CIA there. And only when they were caught uh, doing uh, illegal work on a woman who happened to be the wife of a member of the Canadian Parliament, uh, did they... uh, end up having to spill the beans that they were actually working for the CIA and uh, Dr. Cameron had been assigned as the leader of that that team. And it's no coincidence that Wilder Penfield had allotted his name to Jennifer when she was being mind controlled prior to a meeting with David Icke. And all of the work of Wilder Penfield has been transferred after his death to hospital in Arizona, and thus the name Arizona Wilder is how that had come about. So Jennifer at this moment uh, is in California, no fixed address. New York State is refusing California the right to uh, give her a driver's license. For what reason, no one knows. Uh, They don't answer their own line. the way that a, a bureau in California contacts the bureau in New York, uh, they don't talk to a person. They call a number, it says, leave a message, and then uh, either they call back or don't call back, and if they don't call back, then they're not giving the okay that her record is clear, which, of course, it is. 
uh, and and therefore they can't issue a driver's license. She is uh, uh, a very strong, mental, clear, mentally clear individual, although very disturbed at at her entire process and wants to be back in Canada on the farm because she's been assigned a task that I don't want to get too deeply involved in uh, except to say that the cell has passed on a message that this farm uh, is is to become uh, a site uh, on which will be built a uh, project involving a temple for all faiths to come and learn about life after death. And it will include, apart from the temple, a, uh, an old people's uh, home uh, for those people on the edge of dying there, and uh, another place for abandoned children. And... Um, and then an auditorium where the cell will arrange for meetings with different religions. But the whole purpose of the entire project is that they uh, describe this property as a port of exit. It is, in their words, a vortex, a whirlwind that at one time in the near future, when people have realized that the world is being controlled by sleeper cells, most of which are manufactured uh, currently in the uh, Carthaginian mountains, I think, uh, no, Carmelite mountains in Syria. Carmelite mountains in Syria, and that the world has been run for at least 3,000 years uh, by gene pools manufactured in that area of Syria. Now, the uh, first member of, of uh, uh, these, this gene pool concept is described in the Old Testament in the books of Enoch, which if you look at the word Enoch, it has one E-N-O-C-H stands for a letter K or a mission in life, so the mission of one. And his son was Methuselah, who lived to be 963 years. In other words, longer than anybody can be expected to live, but more than likely it is a story that begins the explanation of genetic engineering. You live, you die, someone takes your genome, places it in an empty female egg, adds the sperm, puts it in a uh, amniotic fluid, shocks it with uh, Ark of the Covenant, and life begins again for this person. Now, this this is a simplification, of course, of genetic engineering and, and exactly how it's done, and, and each item has a specialty, semen, 
are linked to sailors and amniotic fluid are linked to the sap of trees uh, and uh, the egg of course is from a mummy of a person who has lived and died and putting together the whole recipe allows you to start life up again having been the product of lessons learned by Neanderthalers who were originally killed in an avalanche and the survivors tried to revive them only to find out that uh, even though they were frozen under the snow uh, once you thawed them they died uh, and, and trying to figure out how you keep them from dying uh, when they're uh, simply frozen instantly through a process called cryogenics. And it was that that led to an understanding of genetic engineering and the making of uh, people based on a gene pool. Now, of course, if you look at uh, the next stage after Methuselah is, uh, uh, what's his name, uh, Ham, Abraham. Abraham, at the age of 90, is supposed, at the age of 100, is supposed to have given uh, life to a, a baby with his wife, Sarai, uh, who was 90 years old at the time. Well, one knows that that really is not possible, and what you're looking at is more somebody is talking about genetic engineering, a foundling, a baby, which is handed over to them, and, and they raise as their own. And that name of the wife that gave, supposedly gave birth, uh, Sarai is repeated in the word Israel and in the word Syria. Um, F-A-R-I becomes uh, I-S-R-A in Israel. L-E is just the pronoun for uh, male person, le in French. Um, Syria is the next generation. Uh, instead of an I, it's a Y um, that they put in. Uh, uh, which, which basically links genetic engineering as the, the story behind Akhenaten and Nefertiti in the 18th dynasty. When Akhenaten was born, his name was Tutmosis, in the line of many Tutmosis. Not accidentally, it has Tut in it, and it has Moses. And he was uh, evicted or told to leave the country as a child because he had a physical defect that his father, the king, Pharaoh, didn't approve of. What he was, in fact, was a product of uh, a harem run by the king's wife, first wife, called Pi, T-A-Y. And her brother, I, A-Y, was the genetic engineer. And they were basically um, working on pretending that the king would make babies, but the king was gay and didn't have anything to do with the, the women, but the state needed someone who would be declared the king's child, and, and they, 
he made a mistake and he ended up being shipped out of the country because he had a defect in in the shape of his body. Where he was sent was to Syria, to a place called Hurry. And in Syria, he met a woman which we know as Nefertiti. And they had six daughters. And when the king died, the queen demanded that he be allowed to return to Egypt with his wife and family, and that occurred. His uh, reign was something like 16 years. However, Nefertiti uh, disappeared uh, after uh, 12 years and returned four years later, which is the time at which we hear of uh, a man called Moses asking the king permission to let his people go. Well, his wife, Nefertiti, had already gone and set up Israel with a group of women. And those women were impregnated through a process of genetic engineering which began the process to create 10 tribes of Israel and two tribes of priests who came from the area near Jordan. Now, when the story continues and says uh, that Moses led his people uh, to uh, the Nile and crossed the Nile, and the king was defeated in trying to stop him. He then went into the desert for 40 years. Well, the average uh, lifespan at that time was 40 years. So the people that would have been led by Moses, formerly Tutmosis, intermediately Akhenaten, uh, who had gathered all of the information from the priests called Amen and taken it to his own temple for Aten. Uh, the information was taken by Nefertiti and brought to Syria and Israel, and that's how they got started. But obviously, it's not the men that left Egypt that ended up creating Israel, it is more likely Nefertiti and the genetic engineers of Syria who created Israel. It's not uh, a coincidence that when the Persians came in 586 B.C., and threw them all out of Israel in a diaspora, most of the Israelis uh, with uh, an education, priests, and therefore uh, um, one, one tribe was sent on the Mediterranean, the other tribe was brought over land, the overland guys were taken to Persia uh, or Babylon, which was part of Persia. And the other gang went to a place they call Frankland, which we today call Germany. And until uh, the 1900s, uh, it was very well known and taught in schools that uh, Germans came from Israel, and they simply changed religions, but not their culture. And they are assigned a task, and the returning people to Israel are assigned an opposing task, and they spend their time fighting together 
for whatever reason one would like to uh, attach to it is irrelevant to today and the causes of today. The the sales position is that all countries in the world have borders which are a port of entry. Anybody dissatisfied with the country they live in could simply pack their bags and leave and go someplace else. When they were, in fact, someplace else, they, in fact, set up the same kind of governments as they had left, whether uh, republics or democracies or dictatorships or whatever, and it was only a matter of time before the same problems would come back and people would leave the place they went to, probably second, third, fourth, uh, descendants of the originals, uh, would leave and go someplace else. But now there is no place else. The world is divided into countries. And all countries have created similar problems for their minorities. And the minorities fall in, into uh, either a racial or social or financial category. Uh, and they got no place to go. And therefore, according to the cell, their instructions are to inform us that this farm will be converted into what will be known as the port of exit. And once the people are educated into how we got into the mess we're in and that there is no solution any longer other than leaving, not simply leaving this planet, but leaving this universe. They describe the bigger picture as a universe being a container. And there are 26 containers, all in a circle that would make it appear um, somewhat like uh, the stars around the mountain in the uh, Gulf and Western company called Paramount, except they're more like petals on a flower, and that the past has had uh, three universes that were begun and abandoned, and this is the fourth. It is a four-dimensional universe with, with length, height, and width. And time changes everything as the fourth dimension that we would, in fact, um, who are on this farm and are ready to go, would lead a troop of uh, seven billion people who have lived and died and are waiting for their journey. And that this being the end times of reason, common sense, on, uh, in this universe, because everything that gets built from now on is simply going to make it worse, and uh, be applied to many other places within the universe that uh, 
a an artist uh, by the name of fictitious name, I guess, Grandma Moses, uh, has demonstrated in a painting something I guess you would call similar to a shire in uh, Lord of the Rings, uh, which would be the place similar to a fifth-dimensional universe for a new beginning. So you have a series of paintings that begin with Noah's Ark, and it demonstrates that the world is is gene pools. And those gene pools that are used to call the animal human are assigned a task which has a beginning and an end. And once they arrive at the end, they must be destroyed and replaced with a different gene pool for the next stage of development and so on until you get to Noah's Ark where all the gene pools that are there at the time are destroyed so that a new set of genes of human beings totally different from the ones that came before lead uh, the way to Abraham. And from Abraham... There's, again, a change of gene pools, and that continues down the B.C. period to the year zero, and Joseph and Mary are the representatives of uh, uh, a reversal of position. So you have basically a 4,000-year period from Adam and Eve down to Joseph and Mary. And then you have a reversal for 2,000 years more. Gene pools replace the original gene pool, and how you do that is through war, pestilence, famine, and disease. Now, there is uh, also the additional thing of cataclysmic event that can destroy a gene pool. We are at the beginning of that period. The key word is ton, T-O-N, as in Washington. A ton is made up of 2,000 pounds, which is a key to the time frame is the year 2000. And how you get rid of the United States is by washing ton, which basically is another way of saying liquefaction or quicksand. And in order to have a proper amount of liquefaction to destroy millions of people at the same time, you have to have a source of water. And therefore, you create an institution called the UN, which is in French the word one, as in Enoch, or in French, UN. In 1947, and they recreate Israel, 1948, who fight their first war in 1949, all in order to basically tie in to the border between Canada and the U.S. as being the 49th parallel from the Great Lakes to the Pacific Ocean. And you have uh, a number of hints that 
God, there are so many, I, I just can't get into all of them. Uh, this can only be done over time and by people who live and work together because things come up and you think of one more hint of what's happening. And one of the main uh, sources of hints is a movie called Jonathan Livingston Seagull. And living stone is magnetic rock that are charged up by the Ark of the Covenant and the walls came a tumbling down. The same thing is happening to the house that I live in on the farm. Magnetic rocks are exploding underground and the house is collapsing a little bit at a time. Door hinges don't fit. Plumbing starts to leak. Electricity is a problem. Uh, and of course, the charges that these rocks get are surcharges sent by the hydro company and led to a wire that leads to a ground and and charges and surcharges the rocks underground, which because they are uh, made of two different materials, usually granite and uh, quartz, uh, when they're heated or when they're frozen, they react at different temperatures and at one stage of the game, one tries to enlarge while the other one cannot enlarge and is basically stable or contracts and they got nothing to do but break up, they explode. And I would suggest that the magnetic field that is created by that activity has an effect on the glands in the body because we are mostly water and much of what we drink contains iron and certainly in the countryside you can see it uh, a lot more than in the city uh, because your toilet rim turns yellow or your sink or tub turns a yellow ring at the top where the iron is. Well, all the glands in the body are located where they are located because they have a function to play based upon creation's version of a human. However, if you put the human in a magnetic field, then they are contracted and attracted to uh, the force, positive or negative, depending on the circumstance, and they kind of lose their ability to do their job. They're they're full of iron, and they are magnetized. And in women, for example, it's noted that. At around the ages of 27, 28, a lot of women develop uh, <coughs> uh, a movement in their bodies which causes the chest and shoulders to shrink while the butt and hips get larger. For men, a lot of it uh, ends up being um, glands are attracted down through uh, uni un urinary channels and into uh, your the area of your testicles, which basically lock up that area and lead to a situation which impedes uh, erection 
and uh, therefore the birth of children by natural means, and therefore the need to replace children through genetic engineering means, and that is often done in a cloistered monastery by nuns who are uh, agreeing and swearing to their final vows that they are the wife of Jesus or God or whatever you want to call the interloper, the satrap who stole the rights to genetic engineering from creation and use it uh, on purpose to control the lifespan of human beings and their ability to procreate. The, uh, the word Cialis suggests the word Cial, which means the earth in motion, as opposed to Cm, which is the world has halted. Cm also has the letters to Ami in French, or friend of the system, and Islam which gives you a sense of what's going on with a place in Syria and a group called ISIS. Now, the government of Canada has agreed to bring in refugees. So has the United States. My understanding is that the immediate uh, approval for Canada, it's 25,000 people by the end of the year, which means they would have to do security checks that normally take two to three years in a month. And then all of the interviews that are done by security people to see if the person coming in has any possibility of being a terrorist. The problem is the people doing the security checks are already sleeper cells. And therefore, you can bet on which uh, immigrant they will allow into the country is the one that has the right gene pool, not the one that is needed in the country like Jennifer but one that has a gene pool that can be activated at any moment in time. Sure, the guy is an engineer or a plumber or an electrician or whatever worker, but he carries in him a switch or her or in a baby, a switch, that is transferable through birth to their offspring for four generations and can be turned on or off to do anything on a specific date. Uh, in Arizona, a congresswoman was speaking to a crowd on the street and a man from one of the local institutions shot her in the head. Other people walk into theaters and shoot in theaters, not much different from what's going on in Paris these days. All of these things are done to undermine societies at the time they've lost their usefulness. And North America, like the rest of the Western world, has lost its usefulness since the goal they were given to achieve was to create a space program that would enable a spacecraft to leave the solar system, which, of course, as you and I know, Danny, was planned and happened in the year 2011 while we sat looking at the stars out in the back 
And because of the fact that we were spreading the word about what was being done, we seemed to have delayed the pulling of the switch that will cause liquefaction by flooding the United States of America from uh, Lake Superior to New York's Flushing Meadow, where the UN was created. And, of course, similar activities in Canada. Although most of the water will be following the flow that takes it to the U.S. There is a Canadian shield at play and a concept called isostasy in physics, which tells anybody who understands a bit of physics that if you flood land, other land must rise to keep the balance of the earth stable. The Canadian shield has its uh, shape uh, in the letter V, which in French, V stands for life. And the letter V has its point at a city in the United States right across the St. Lawrence Seaway called Ogdensburg, 35 miles from here. So where Jennifer had to live for two and a half years until they tried to kill her and she had to come as a refugee. The uh, eastern point goes towards Labrador. The western point goes towards Great Slave Lake in the Northwest Territories, which means that the piece of land on which the St. Lawrence Seaway sits will rise. It happens to be, at this moment in time, one mile wide, 35 feet deep, off of Lake Ontario. Yet if you create a cataclysmic break at Lake Superior and send the water down, there will be a flood of immeasurable proportion that will arrive at that point in Lake Ontario in a place called Lansdowne at the beginning of the St. Lawrence Seaway. But the St. Lawrence Seaway, which is 35 feet deep and one mile wide, will not be able to allow that water, that mass of water, to go through in whole. And secondly, it will be rising, which means that even the water that goes through today wouldn't be able to get through because it would be higher would be hitting a wall. And all of that water would back up and destroy through liquefaction or flooding Chicago, Detroit, Cleveland, Toledo, Rochester, Syracuse, and so on and so on all the way to the capital of New York, City and then down to Flushing Meadow. The plan was devised by the Vikings and their troglodyte friends, their cave dwelling friends, while all attention was being diverted to crusades in the east in Jerusalem. The Vikings were studying the needs. And what they established is that this particular farm would be the best place for 
life to be established that will continue following the cataclysmic event. And that a number of the people who would come here would stay behind and run the education network of Temple and uh, Home for the Aged and Home for the Orphans and demonstrate how life after death really does exist through a means of genetic and genetic engineering and uh, quantum entanglement basically means that we are a twisted pair of uh, genetic material. And when we die, one part of that twisted pair unwinds and remains basically in the area of the physical body and it can be used for genetic engineering. While the other part becomes what one would refer to as a ghost. And Tom Byberg, who lived here for 15 years as a tenant and was murdered at the hospital because they no longer need him and he would have been a problem by speaking out about what he knew as a former Viking. Unfortunately for them, he already had, and he continues to speak to me. And I continue to speak to you. And you continue to speak to whoever has a functioning brain. Few though they may be, those who are here will either remain here to continue the education or join uh, at creation's will a movement of people who will guide all those 7 billion people who have lived and died and are waiting at the gate. And we will be herded by the impossible animal who itself cannot be herded known as cats, which is basically a house cat today for those that live indoors and a mountain cat for those that get larger and live in caves as humans used to live in caves at the beginning of their journey. And therefore, when you look at a Canadian bank's emblem, RBC, you'll see a mountain lion with its paws around the planet Earth and its jaw open, reflecting the day when a mountain lion carried the firstborn child to survive on planet Earth into a cave and provided it a structure to put, be protected from the weather and predators and nourished it. Of course, there is a hint of that in the movie called Tarzan, raised by animals in the jungle, and then becomes their leader. So here we are. Jennifer is being locked out of the country by an agency whose allegiance is not to Canada done by a government whose 
interest uh, for the last 10 years was to benefit their own at the expense of everybody else. Will the new government change things? They have it in their power to change things and make things public, will they? Not until the cell sees the government of Canada making the move to bring Jennifer back to the farm to lead the uh, group of cats. They, they call her Jennifer, Queen of Cats, uh, because she is the only one that creation has named as the leader of survival. If they don't allow her, and more than allow her, bring her back home, then the future is bleak for all of us. If they bring her home, then there's another place to go in the future for people who live and die and are not involved in the criminal activity that has been the modus operandi of bodyguards, of policemen, of uh, border guards, coast guards around the world. Genetic engineering is the basis of birth, whether it's done through copulation on a third, second, third, fourth generation, or done in a lab on the first generation. We all have suffered the engineer's scalpel in one way or another over, as I said, four generations, which normally means 80 to 100 years. No one can say, well, I'm not genetically engineered. They are not sitting on their parents' bed while they copulated. Their parents were not sitting on their parents' bed while they copulated. Their parents were not sitting on their grandparents' bed while they copulated. And who's to say that the great-great-great-grandmother was not a foundling placed in a family and raised by an existing family as their own, who passes on the gene pool to the great-grandmother, to the grandmother, to the mother, to the child, and to their offspring. Canada was created by the coming of Europeans and Chinese and Vikings to a place called Newfoundland. Strange, they have the word found as foundation to their country. Foundlings. But it's not just Newfoundland. It's Newfoundland and Labrador, the door to the lab is in Labrador. And they created the French people and put them in what we call Nova Scotia today until they were sure they had it right. And then they moved those people out into Quebec and they agreed to raise foundlings 
And as a child, I always noted that Ontario families had two or three kids, while Quebec families were 12, 14, 15, 20 kids. Those 12, 15, 20 kids now live in families in Ontario, in Manitoba, in New Brunswick, in Maine, in Vermont, in New York, New Hampshire, New Jersey, all the way down to New Orleans, where they are called Cajuns instead of Acajuns. We have to help get the word out that Jennifer must be brought back to the farm. She must be allowed to raise 100 cats. More is okay. They will stay here behind. Those that die while she's here join the 7 billion people who have died and are sitting there waiting at the gate in this universe, waiting to be extracted and brought to the fifth dimension, or as religion calls it, heaven. Yeah. So is it not as simple as getting her a plane ticket? Giving her a plane ticket would put her in the hands of CBSA. Mm -hmm. That's what we were planning to do. But until we have assurances from the government that they are the government of Canada and not CBSA, Canada Border Security Agency, as they claim they are, then Jennifer would just be put back in jail and re-transferred back to California or killed. They own uh, medical practitioners who can and do kill people. We have to build a legal team who will then demand of the government that they bring her back. And that requires crowdfunding. And crowdfunding can only begin when people understand the problem. And that's why I think that your talk show or uh, website is necessary to that process. Eventually, Jennifer has to do a website on cats and their beginnings, how, in fact, cats brought humans into their cave so they would survive. And thousands and thousands of years later, the Egyptians brought cats into their houses so they would survive. It was a tit for tat. But the cats made humans possible. And that's why in the crest of the Royal Bank of Canada, at the bottom are the three letters RBC. They want you to believe that that means Royal Bank of Canada. But in fact, it means the beginning of mankind was rats, bats, and cats. And outside, a mountain cat. The rat took care of investigating the cave. The bat took care of 
crossing those expanses which were too wide for rats to swim across or high enough to go into the rafters. And then the third product was a cat which lived in the cave but also was able to roam outside. And as soon as the cat went outside, some got bigger, and we called them lions. And if you look at the pyramids in Egypt, you have three pyramids, rats, bats, and cats. And then you have the mountain lion called the sphinx. And if you look at the face of the sphinx, it's not a male. It's a female lion. It was a statue in the middle of an oasis. It was saying, as creation says, come to me. I'm the nourisher. This is where you get nutrition and why they chose in in, uh, God's world, the number three, as, as their position, because number three is a pair of breasts. In phonetics of language they do the work that's why they're called the B and the letter B is a pair of breasts we all are descendant from a compound complex product of evolution rather than genetic engineering, which is evolution. And evolution is a feminine principle, while God is described as a male, one forgets that another name is God the Father. That confirms for most people that they're talking about a male. But what they're really referring to is a genetically engineered pregnant woman. Fat her. Or the song by one of the current singers of our time called Fat Bottom Ladies Make the World Go Round. They are the evil. Evolution is the normal. And Jennifer and Cass represent the future and the past. Time to move. Yeah. <laughs> I've asked Jennifer once she gets over her laryngitis to call you and you can hear it in her own voice. Not right now because it's awfully scratchy. (laughs) So right now it's a matter of survival, both of the farm, the cats, Jennifer, her ability to display art that speaks what we're talking about. I got to go now. All right, Glenn. Bye for now. Take care.